real life, and we can just just drop that down just a hair. Okay, very good. That's good, right there. Just stay the case I need to. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Sunday Bible Church Midweek Bible Study. We welcome everyone who's here tonight. It's great to have you. We welcome our friends on uh, YouTube Live. Uh, and we have comments that are open on YouTube Live, so you can comment, you can give us thumbs down, thumbs up, whatever you want to do. We're on Facebook Live, so you can comment, uh, ask questions, disagree, whatever you want to do. We say uh, hi to all of our Center Beach Bible Church friends who, who can't be here tonight. I say hi to my River and the Gracewood, uh, Gracewood friends, uh, Long Island North Road friends, and everyone from the United States, from Kentucky, to Florida, to Arizona, all of our friends who listen across the fruited plains, and even those who listen outside the nation. Uh, we thank you for following us here. And we're going to get into a real heavy study this morning, uh, this evening, excuse me, and uh, we're going to start out with a real strange title, and hopefully you'll stick around as we go into this. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to open up our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, 16, and 17. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15, 16, and 17. And in case you didn't get the title, the title for tonight is Kooky Christians and Sharing Our Faith Properly. So, that should pique your curiosity of what strange things we might talk about tonight. 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you. Do it with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, which they are, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Well, what an applicable scripture. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for doing well than for evil doing. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we call upon you tonight, Lord, to really just be with us in this study, Lord. Uh, as we always say, Lord, give the winds a mighty voice and take this message to the four corners of the galaxies, Lord. Pierce our hearts, Lord, and rock us, Lord, as a church, Lord, as we begin with looking at ourselves first and where we have dropped the ball and where we have made a mess of the church, Lord. Christianity has become a mess not because of Christ, but because of the Christians, Lord. Let us get this all straightened out tonight, Lord, and be bold enough to say what needs to be said. We pray that you would be with us tonight and we would feel your Holy Spirit's presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So tonight, uh, going to be part one, because I don't think we're going to get through it all. There's going to be one part, but there's just so much to talk about. Anyway, uh, I want to talk about some facts that we really have to get on the table here. That, you know what, it's a wonder, and I was thinking about this, that people are even coming to Christ at all. Uh, because when I look at who we are as Christians, it's really despite who we are that they're coming to Christ. Because we're not the examples that we need to be. And it's almost as God, as God is saving people despite us. And He is saving people. Many people are coming to the truth. And God is using these hard times to shake those and to shake what we really stand on in these days. Now, what I mean, and what I want to do before we get to sharing our faith, is I want to start with a brutal, honest attack on ourselves. Now, why do I do that? Because the scripture says in 1 Peter 4, 17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin with us, what shall be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, people were barely saved, <laughs> where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? People, if we don't, and I, I share this all the time, if we don't expose ourselves and be honest about ourselves, how can we shine brightly enough so that others will believe the truth that we say we believe so much? And as I said before, 
many times, and it's a sad thing, but some of the kookiest and oddest people I have ever met have been Christians. I put that in parentheses. Now, I'm not saying that every Christian is like this, because if there are some good, holy, glorious examples of Christ in serving and obeying God's word and living out your testimony. But the problem is, that's the exception. That's not the rule anymore. Meaning there are more Christians that are not living like we should than are. And this is why many, if not most times, and I know we're going to speak of about a half an hour here, I'm going to just, just pound you with some issues that we have created ourselves and the enemy laughs. Because many times, if not most, we as Christians, we are hypocrites. We are judgmental. We are ignorant, even of our own faith or what we believe. We're frauds, we're fakes, we're phonies, we're ultra-sensitive, easily hurt, no sense of humor. Pious, self-righteous, selfish, greedy, untimely, ill-spoken, unspoken. That's just me. You're supposed to laugh. No. Okay. That was a joke. But we must never forget one thing, that we are sinners like everyone else. And the only thing that makes us set apart from the world is we are forgiven sinners. Remember that. We're forgiven sinners. Moving on, I believe our greatest liability as a church of Jesus Christ is our foolish pride. Example, we are so divided that you take a group of 10 or 20 Christians, you put them in a room, and you ask them what they believe, you're probably sadly going to get 10 different opinions. Why? Why is that? Why is the church so fragmented? It's never been more fragmented. Never been. Remember, when the church was established at Pentecost, and even before when God established his, his word, there was no, oh, I believe this and you believe that. It was, it's, it's just what it is. That's it. But you know why this has happened? Because we have simply been taught we have never studied. See, to be taught and to study are two different things. We have become lazy Christians who accept everything everyone tells us, and we don't do our work because we're so lazy. Yeah, he said it, it must be true. But we see that in the news today. Everybody well, it said it on the news, it must be true. In the book of Acts 17:11. It says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things are so. A good Christian should look for facts. They should not believe everything I say, or any pastor says, or any theologians say. They should get their Bibles, and they should be war-torn, from you searching the scriptures. Sometimes we trust people and what they say more than what the Word of God says. 2 Peter 1.20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. And you know what we have today? Thousands and thousands of private interpretations. Well, you believe that, and I believe this. There can't be two truths. There can only be one. 1 Corinthians 14, 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches. If there's not peace in Christianity, it's because there's confusion. That's not from God. Example. Example of what these confusions have brought and made the church today. And why we have all these designations of types of Christians. Don't go down the list here. We have fundamental Christians. We have Pentecostal Christians. We have Calvinist Christians. We have Arminian Christians. We have pre-mid, pre post-tribulation Christians. We have denominational Christians, i.e. those who follow a religion instead of the word of God. We have the prosperity gospel Christians. We have the new apostolic reformation Christians. We have the reformed Christians. Why don't we just have Bible-believing, non-denominational churches? 
Because you know what? When Jesus and the church was established, it was non-denominational and it was Bible-believing. Okay? Simple as that. You, you talk to ten different Christians, you'll have ten different ideas on Israel, on the future, on the gifts of the Spirit. And simple Christianity, just in its most base forms. You ask somebody, what's the gospel? Can you answer that question? Can you tell someone, how do you get to heaven? Can you really explain it? We have those who are traditional Christians versus progressive Christians. We have the hands-up Christians versus, versus the down, hand-down Christians. We have the pew Christian versus the chair Christians. We actually had this battle in this church at a business meeting once. The people got up, we want chairs, we want pews. You have a big battle about it. Women pastor versus men pastors. We have those who care, who like to call themselves, well, they're the pro-life Christians, they're the anti-gay Christians, they're the social cause Christians. We have the political national Christians who believe that politics will save the day, and that's our calling as Christians. We have conservative Christians, we have liberal Christians. We have the hymn-only Christians, we have the contemporary music worship Christians. We have, the K, we have the KJV, King James Version only. We have the NIV Christian people. And they're always fighting each other. Then we have the new things like the Kingdom Now theology, replacement, theologians, preterism. And if you doubt me on these, run into some of these people. And they will beat the crud out of you with their philosophy and their better witness and their better wisdom. And it won't let you come up for air until you concede to their beliefs. Churches split up over this stuff all the time. Do you know how many churches have arguments while the world outside is going to hell without Christ and the church is arguing about the color of the curtains? Happens all the time and the enemy laughs. We have Christians who are brash, cold, in your face, and we have those Christians who don't say anything. Keep their mouths shut. I just keep it to myself. It's my own thing. I had one Christian last year. I, I do not make this up. Lord is my witness. I posted something on Facebook. person wanted to hunt me down and kill me. So I'm going to kill you. He wasn't kidding. We have those who talk a lot but know little. We have those who know a lot but do little. Knowledge of the scriptures don't mean you live them. And I'd rather see someone who live the, what little they know than just talk about all they know. We have those who actually serve God in the local church, praise God, and we have those who safely stay home behind their computers and post their Facebook rants all day and play it safe. We call those lukewarm Christians. Preaching to the choir all day, thinking they're doing something for God. We have those who spend more time arguing with other Christians than preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. We have those who say they're Christians who live just like the world. We say we praise the name of Jesus in one breath, and we use his name as a curse word in the next breath. I've seen some Christians who jump up and down at church services. They go into convulsions on Sunday, yet Monday morning they are as quiet as a church mouse, no pun intended, as they lie and cheat to go up the ladder and have affairs with everybody at work. Yet they're so passionate about their God on Sunday. We can be excuse me, we can be arrogant. We can be unteachable, we can be legalistic, and most of us think, and this is the problem, our way is the best way, our church is the best church, and our pastor is the best pastor. And I have some news for you, Center Beach Bible Church is not the best church, I'm not the best pastor. And I bet you one day when we stand before the Lord, we'll find out we probably should have leaned this way a little bit more instead of leaning that way. Because if we think we had everything a thousand percent right, we're probably going to be surprised. It's the heart that remains teachable that says, hmm, 
Let's see if the scriptures say this is so. Not what the tradition of the church was. Now, if you wonder, now the reason why I bring this up, if you wonder why we have no credibility with the world, we have done it to ourselves. We want them to listen to what we have to say, but we can't get on the same page about anything. And we look often foolish, silly, childlike, and we do look like hypocrites. But is it hopeless? Absolutely not. Because we've been learning that nothing is impossible with our God. Amen. Nothing. So what do we do, people, when it comes to the gospel? We keep it simple. Which is really what the gospel is. Okay? We can take one scripture like John 3.16. We can speak it and we can live it and you can turn the world upside down. But anyway, tonight, this is what we're going to cover. I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments of presenting the gospel to the world properly. And just so you know, this is not optional, okay? Presenting the gospel to the world. It's what we're here for. There's that. People say, what's my reason for living? To bring glory to God and tell other people about Him. That's why we're here. And if that's our sole purpose, well, we better get it right. And we better live it well. In Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. That's serious stuff. So here are the ten C's of sharing your faith. Number one, what to say. Number two, what not to say. When to talk, when not to talk. Battles to engage in, battles to not engage in. What to focus on, what not to focus on. When to walk away, when not to walk away. And I'm going to give you, and you probably won't get it till well, the week, oh, this, a reminder, next week there is no Bible study, we have a business meeting. But the week after that, I have a surprise ending to this study. Okay, because the best way to reach someone sometimes is not what you think. And it's going to be something that is really easy to do and you never even have to open your mouth. Because I know we're all afraid about sharing our faith. I understand that. I call it worldless, excuse me, wordless evangelism. But I don't want to, I don't want to let that out of the bag yet. But anyway... What else, what else we're going to talk about? We're going to talk about unique ways to share your faith. Okay? Uh, we're going to talk about, lastly, and hopefully next time you'll bring your questions, we're going to talk about any questions you have that you're always afraid. What if they ask me about carbon-14 and all that stuff and about the evolution? Okay? I want you to bring, write your questions down, and you know what? We're going to challenge. You can challenge me, and let's see if we can come up with answers. We're supposed to give an answer to every man about the joy. We're supposed to know what we're talking about. But let's get to the ten C's of sharing our faith. Number one, what to say. Tell them about what Jesus came to do. Explain religion versus a relationship. Only one of them gets you to God. Explain that we can't be good enough and if you do anything, plant a seed. In Matthew 3.16, for God so, excuse me, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, I read that already. Uh, actually, John 4.37 is what I wanted to read. And here is that true saying, one soweth and another reapeth. Okay? You don't always have to win everybody. Just plant a seed wherever you go. Number two, what not to say. And I've learned this over years of making a lot of mistakes. Don't go after people's religion. Just give them the truth. The truth will expose the lies every time. If you just focus on everything you're doing wrong, who wants to hear that? Tell them about what Jesus said. The truth speaks for itself. You don't have to bash them on over their head or what they believe. I thought I, I used to do that, and it didn't do anything. It never led anyone to Christ. It's got them really angry at me. Mm. 
Don't talk down to people for being equal. Too many arrogant Christians. And some theologies lead to more of those Christians who are like that, just so arrogant. Don't talk too much, like me. <laughs> and don't demand a conversion. We're like, I like this person saved. <laughs> oh, they didn't get saved. Please, just say the word so I can tell you about it. Say it today. <laughs> Don't rush things. Don't get into end time stuff. Okay? Unless they ask you. You don't go up to anybody. Have you heard about the Antichrist and the false prophet and, and, you, know, and uh, the, uh, you know, and don't go talking about what happened in Genesis 6 and the next one. It, that's not how you're going to reach somebody with the gospel. If they ask about it, well, you should know about it. But that's not what they need to hear right away. 1 Timothy 1.15 This is a faithful saying and worthy of all, excuse me, worthy of all acceptation. Paul saying this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's what Paul said. Nice and simple. This is it. Christ came into the world to save sinners and I'm a chief sinner. I'm the worst. What a great testimony. Romans 6.23, really simple scriptures. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the payment, I mean, this is the penalty if we don't have our sins paid for. And if we do, that's the gift. Mm -hmm. Salvation. When to talk. Number three, when you're alone with someone. Okay? When you feel moved. By God. Sometimes, have you ever been feel moved to speak to someone? You go, I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying anything to this person. But I know God wants me to say something. I don't know what to say. <laughs> when God opens the door. When it's on your dime. And I'm going to explain that in the next, the next one, number four. When not to talk. In a group of people, unless you're really good at what you do, or you have the gift, because there is the gift of evangelists. Mm -hmm. okay, they can go on a street corner, and they have that gift. Okay, that's something that no, not everyone has. One of the things I learned, you know, in my life prior to being a pastor, you know, sitting about, you know, around the lunch table with a bunch of construction workers, and getting into an argument, it's like, you know, ten people against you, it's not going to work out well because everyone is not going to really say what they really feel because they're going to want to be the tough guys. But one-on-one -on -one mm. is where you're going to have more success. Mm -hmm. Don't try to take on a whole legion of people. Mm -hmm. okay? you, we're not that smart. Okay? And when to talk, well, excuse me, when not to talk, uh, when you're on the clock. And that's what I meant about the dime. You know, and this is an important thing. And I ran into this a lot, and I learned this at my job. You know what? It was easy, you know what? I'm, when I'm getting paid, well, I'll, I'll share my faith with someone. But I'm not getting paid to share my faith. And it's not a good testimony. Mm -hmm. And it really tests the person, and it tests you, because what I learned to do was, you know what? If somebody said, oh, well, you know, what are you and everything? So if you're really interested, stay after work. Because it's a great testimony, because I said, I, and, I, and I would say, I really don't want to steal from my boss. Because mm -hmm. if I'm talking about God to you, he's not paying me to talk about God. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would have some people who would say, okay, they stay after work. And if you really want to share your faith, do you, know, you want to go home or do you want to stay after work and talk about God? That's a big question. Mm -hmm. Let your testimony right there by saying, I don't want to steal from the boss. Be the thing that plants a seed in that person's heart. Don't pretend to be a theologian. Be a sinner that's been forgiven and show them that you're so thankful. Mm -hmm. They say, I'm just thankful that God forgave me. Mm -hmm. You know, I am just, I am so, I'm just so thankful because you have no idea. It will start out with you, not with them. What battles to engage in? This is very important. Only spiritual ones. Jesus and the gospel, nothing else. And don't, and boy, I, I think we've all done this, I know I have, don't use the gospel to fix somebody's life situation. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you, know, you just need to come to Jesus Christ, and, and a cancer will go away, and, and your marriage will come together, and your kids will turn around, money will start coming in. 
The gospel is not to turn your life around, it's to turn your soul around. Amen. And with the soul comes the life. But don't get that mixed up. Hebrews 10.39, we are not of them that draw back unto tradition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Number six, what battles not to engage in. Now, I know I'm going to get heat for this one. But I tell you, people, this is, this is the Word of God. And, you've, and I'm, I'm going to say stuff really blunt right now. And I want you to really think about it. Number one, talking politics is not the gospel. And I'll give you an example. I have a dear friend of mine. Called me, told me he was so excited, he finally told off this person of a certain political persuasion. And he told them who to vote for. God's really going to be proud of me. I said, you, what did you do for the gospel? What did you do? Well, I told them who to vote for. People, the gospel is not a political party. Winning them over to a party or a candidate doesn't do anything for their eternal state. I don't care what anybody says. So please, don't confuse these things. And something else, don't confuse getting sober or getting off drugs with getting saved. Mm. Sure, we feed the poor, but only as an example to reach them. We help the broken. We save the world who's going through hard times. But that's not the gospel. It's a stepping board to present the gospel. Matthew 26, 11. Jesus said, For well, you have the poor with you always, but me you don't always have. You can ask Pastor Jim, and he'll tell you flat out. I mean, Pastor Jim from the White House Mission, they're feeding thousands and thousands of people all over Long Island. They're feeding the poor. But that's not why they do it. They get poor people jobs, but that's not why they do it. They get drug addicts off the streets, but that's not why they do it. They do it to bring them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, you feed someone food for their stomach, they'll listen to food for their heart. We get so caught up in doing good deeds, we forget, well, the, then we get all the glory. Look at what I've done. Pastor Jim once told me he had a guy, or I think it was a lady, pull up in a Mercedes with a big fancy iPhone and stuff, wanted to go on the food line. And the people go, hey, what's this lady doing? Let her come. I don't care. It's not about the food. Let her take the food. But she's got to hear, sit here and listen, because that's what Pastor Jim does. You want to get fed? You've got to listen to the gospel. He's an evangelist, okay? And he goes in the woods and preaches to all these people, man, and he's got the police and news after him. He's, he's on fire. He's like John the Baptist, man. I tell you, he's really a great guy. Wears sandals and everything. <laughs> Now, I'm going to say some really stuff that's going to get me into trouble here. People, remember, you can do a lot of good for people, but it's not the same as saving them. Because remember this, sober people without Christ still go to hell. Fed people without Christ go to hell. Go to hell. Liberals who you, can, who you convert into conservatives, when they die without Christ, they go to hell. God doesn't go, oh, you're a conservative, come on in. <laughs> Ladies who don't have an abortion, when they die without Christ, they go to hell. A gay person that you convert to being straight, when they die without Christ, they go to hell. Again, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. All the other issues, they're not there. Number seven, what to focus on? Sin, the problem and the solution. That's it, people. Romans 6, 23, wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Great scripture, great scripture. Number eight, what not to focus on? What sins people are into? Don't focus on their particular sins. You know, you shouldn't be doing that. 
You're not great like I am. Remember, we don't focus on what sins we do. We focus on the fact that we are sinners. That's a big difference. And that's how the church has lost all of its credibility. Because if you ask a typical person, what's it called? Oh, they hate these people and they hate those people. We became the people of hate. We're known as the haters. How did that happen? See, God loves the sinner. We don't for some reason. James 2.10 for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. It doesn't matter what sin you're in. For he said, do not commit adultery. But he also said, do not kill. Now if you commit no adultery, yet you kill, you are still a transgressor of the law. So stop saying, well, they're really bad sinners. Or, oh, I'm not so bad of a sinner. They're doing this sin. They're doing that sin. It doesn't matter. You choose your own poisons. I have enough sin in me to send me to hell without doing all the big ones. Okay? Just, just lie. Lust. Covet your neighbor. Okay? It doesn't take big ones, people. When to walk away. When people are not receiving it. When it's getting tense, you don't want to get tense. Because then now you start getting angry. You're going to believe what I told you. Because once we go from loving them to want to punch people in the face, that's not a good thing. Okay? When to walk away, when it switches from talking about God to other issues. I found this happen so much. We start with the gospel, next thing you know, I'm talking about, you know, border security. and That has nothing to do with the gospel. Okay? Yeah, I can state my, you know, my stand on those things. I'm not saying, you know, but that's not the gospel. And we get diverted by the enemy because we have to say, no, I don't want to talk about that. that we, that's something else, okay? I'm not going to give you my opinion on that. What I really want to do is get you saved. Because people, we can, and I don't know who said it. This is the most profound thing. You cannot legislate morality. You can't do it. You say, we've got to make these people be good. We've got to make them believe them. No, no. The only way this world and this nation is going to change is if Christ dwells in their heart. Amen. How did I change and start to see things from a different light? No one said, you better believe this. No, Christ did it. Amen. We're trying to shove, this is the way you need to live, down their throats. They're not going to accept it. They can't. They can't. They're spiritually discerned. They can't. Christ has to enter them. When the Holy Spirit enters you through salvation, He changes the heart. All things have gone to the past. All things have become new. We're trying to solve the problem going through the wrong door. You know the way to solve the problem? It goes back to the beginning. Get people saved. One person at a time. What do I got time for that? We got to go. No. One person at a time. And they'll be changed. God will change their life. And then they'll change someone else's life. And then, you know, before you know it, you have a town that's thinking like God. Mm -hmm. Then you have, then you have a, a state that's thinking like God. And then you have a nation that's thinking like God. Jesus says some things about when to walk away. In Matthew 10, 14, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Don't forget that. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Matthew 7, 6, you know, and I learned this one the hard way. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. You know, you know what I learned? You know, I'm, in, in the years past, I'm talking to people. He's like, you have great success for people who are high on drugs and drunk. <laughs> oh, Jesus, sounds really good, man. I want them. Like, man, this is great. Next day, he forgot everything at all. <laughs> Don't go with this. Yeah, I know the word of God never comes back void, mm -hmm. but I tell you, you're wasting your time. 
They're not going to remember. You spend time, you know, with people who are not listening or they're mocking you or they make you believe they're listening. You're throwing your pearls before swine. Walk on. There's many, there's plenty, there's never going to be something we, one thing we're never going to run out of is sinners who need to be saved. There's plenty of them. When not to walk away. This is number 10. We're actually going a lot faster than I thought. I'm going to be done too early. I, uh, that's going to be moved to a, a one part of When not to walk away. When you see God moving in someone's heart and you see God opening a door, maybe a hurt or something from their past life, and you'll see, oh, that's going to be the way I'm going to go with this person here. Okay? They have that really weak that spot that really someone hurt them. And you can, you know, use that as a door to get in there. The tough questions. Okay, we're actually, of course, we have extra time. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna be able to finish this tonight. Think about some tough questions that you're always afraid to be asked. Okay, and you can throw them at me, and I'll take all the heat. And this way, if I stumble in front of the whole world, <laughs> let it be on me. Okay, because I don't know everything. But I want to give you the bonus way to share the gospel. Okay, the bonus way to share the gospel. And you're going to love this one, maybe. Because you don't have to say a word to lead people to Christ. It's leading people who are in the dark by being the light. Mm -hmm. Okay? Start living like godly people. That's the biggest problem. Matthew 5, we're going to read verses 10 to 16. What does Jesus say? These are the Beatitudes. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. There's a little bit of motivation. When you're going to get made fun of for telling people about Jesus, Jesus says, happy you'll be. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and sh say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Expect that, but be glad. Pastor Jim will always say, when something, you know, they be getting vandalized, they get so much trouble there. He goes, we're doing something great for the gospel, we're getting persecuted. That's how Pastor Jim is. <laughs> they're chasing us out of here, and they're chasing us there, and they're breaking our windows, and they're stealing our catalytic converters. They have all those vans, they keep on stealing their catalytic converters in Belfort there. And he'll praise God. We're doing something right. We're getting persecuted for the kingdom. <laughs> Jesus says that. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. But here's the point. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost his savor, his taste, wherewith shall it be salt? And how is the world going to see Christ? It is henceforth good for nothing. We've become Christians who are good for nothing. But to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. And here's those famous words. We all say it, but we don't understand it. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men take a candle and put it under a, can no, under a table. No, you put it on top so everyone can see it. Isn't that great how Christ is... Makes it plain. Listen, if you got a candle in your living room, do you put it under the table when it's dark? No. You put it on top. Get a big wall. You know? You get it? And what does he say? So let your light so shine. This is the important part that Jesus says. That they may see your good works and glorify the Father that's in heaven. This is the bonus, people. Example of how to share your faith without saying the word. And I'm going to tell you that what I did. Because I have never been Mr. Big Bull stand on a street corner. I try it you know, door to door and all that stuff and supermarkets. And, you know, it, it's, it's not what I feel comfortable with. But I remember at my, my, when God gave me a really great job at my last job. And, and I say, God, you know what? I love you so much and I want to share my faith. I, I can't open my mouth. I'm afraid. I don't know what to say. I made you a deal. I made a deal with God. I said, I am going to live with as much integrity 
at my job, the people, if they come and ask me, what's up with you? I can tell them. Then it's my response. Because they came and asked me. And I tell you people, that worked so good for me. Just live good. Okay? People, because you know what? They read what we are. And you know what matters? And that's why this whole thing it doesn't care what you, you know, well, how we dress matters. How we talk matters. You throw in F bombs out all day long, and then you tell them about Jesus Christ? What we're into. How we treat issues at work with people. People watch this. If you want a testimony, you get persecuted at work. You have a, how do you get people watching? Hey, I'm not sure anybody feel like that. You're not going to get back in that guy's face the way he treated you? You're watching that. One of the things I learned is I found that when people knew I was a Christian, they were watching me all the time. Mm. Say, I saw you say a curse word. You slipped up there. Like, why? Wow, they really watching. I do one thing out of character. You know? All of a sudden, they, they, they're looking to see that I'm going to be this great thing. I remember this one I'm at my job. I, I, I was really crazy about this. And this guy that I work with, you know, he was like taking everything from work. That's, they don't care. They figure it into the whole bill. It's part of the thing. Everybody does it. He's filling up his car with that gas pump and all that stuff. Yeah. So, you know, I would borrow like a quart of oil and ask the boss, and I go to the store, we turn it. What are you doing? Isn't it crazy? I, you know, my, my wife would call me, need a toilet bowl, toilet paper at home. I, I bought a plastic garbage bag. I would borrow one from work. We didn't have any. Next day, I would, I'm bringing this plastic bag back. You know, I need the hardware for a project. I needed a bolt and some nuts and washers. I really took it to the extreme because I knew this guy was watching. He would think, you are insane. Nobody cares. Take it. Just take it. I said, but God watches. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what? I never had to tell him I'm a Christian. I never had to bring up the gospel because he wanted to know what's with you. And you know how many people come up to me after a couple, you know, maybe after a couple of months working with me, they go, I think, well, please, I am no saint. I, I actually am a saint. We're all saints. It's <laughs> children of God. But you know what I mean. I'm not perfect. I did a lot of sins. I, I messed up opportunities. I did a lot of bad things, too. But I really, really tried. And people, and one of the things I did was change, one of the things God did, he took away my language right away. I had a horrible, this F-bomb all over the place. And you know what? That was the most impacting thing because people would say, I can't figure you out, Craniac. He used to call me. What's up with you? And they would go, they were like really pondered. They, they, something was different. Because I just, I didn't say what I was. I just did my job. You know, I'm not going until the bell rings. It's time to go home. The boss is not here. Let's go early. No, you go. I'm staying here. Then they don't trust you, but they think you're going to be a snitch. Huh? Mm -hmm. I said, I don't care about what you guys do. This is what I do. But they would say, you know what? You don't curse. That's what stood out. I said, I said, I don't know. I never realized. No, you can't say the F word, can you? <laughs> and you know what? And I would tell people, because you know what? Don't, because sometimes you'll have these things where people will say, oh, you're the Christian. I'm sorry I said that in front of you. I know I can't. I said, I don't care what you say. I said, but if you really care what bothers me, just don't use the Lord's name in vain. I'm not going to melt if I get curse words or dirty jokes. I'm not like this little fragile thing. They you will always like it. No, I live like you guys. I know what it's like. Don't change for me. You change for God if you want. Don't change for me. But if, if you really care, just don't say the name of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as a curse word. How we deal and act at Walmart, people. You know the worst thing? That I can every and I heard it. Shame. It's, it was always the same person. There was, was a person came to this church once, and you know, and I would always refer you guys to people. Go here, go there. Good mechanic, good this. This person, wherever they went, who is that person? He's the worst person, the worst complaining, the worst example of a Christian. So I got to the point where I didn't tell that person where to go anymore. <laughs> Why is it anywhere you go, you make a big scene? You are the worst example of Christ I've ever seen. I'm embarrassed when people call me. Is that guy, he says he's from your church. Yeah, he's from my church. 
Yeah, yeah, he comes here. He says he goes to your church, yeah, I know. <laughs> How we raise our children matters. Testimonies matter. How we deal with our money matters. Taxes and honesty in business negotiations. Well, that's that stuff, and this is, you know, we separate that from the, my Christian life. No, you don't. I remember, you know, the greatest thing, I, I remember back when I was at my other job, my accountant, he would say, you know, you, know, you give a lot of money to church, he goes, you could be living a lot better. And I say, he goes, you give an extremely large, I've never seen anybody give so much money. Why do you, I, I said, well, I'm, I'm doing fine. Okay. I thought I'm living good now. So, and it was like, he scratched his head. He never understood it. Being a person of integrity with your interactions, that's the biggest thing, people. How we deal with our neighbors. Because you know what? The enemy is going to put you to the test. Mm -hmm. You can come home from church with your Bible and, <laughs> you know, and when your neighbor's throwing garbage over your fence or whatever, or his dog ate up all your stuff, how do you deal with it? How many of us have lost our tempers? I have. Did I ever deal wrong? I have. Did I feel horrible about it? I have. How we deal with our family members. If you have a family member who's not saved and you're more concerned about how your feelings or how they interacted with you, they're watching you. It's not about if we get to be recognized for right or wrong. It's about them seeing a testimony in us. Well, I don't care about that. I'll be done if my kids do I'll be done if my wife speaks to me that way. What about what your neighbors see? What about what your kids see? It's, it's really where the rubber meets the road. I shared this on my Tuesday night. One of the most... Horrible, it's not a horrible experience, but talk about, you want to feel this small, a quick story, you know, I was, I used to, a old job, I used to work on the side on, on trucks, and I would, you know, modify trucks for people, and lights, and all kinds of stuff, and I had this one customer that I, I worked out in my own, my own house garage, and I, I, he would spend thousands of dollars, and I was always customizing stuff, but his bill started to get bigger, and bigger, and he owed me like $900, and then he decided he just wasn't going to pay it anymore. So it started to get to me, you know? And I would try to chase this guy around, find out where he is, call him up, he'd hang up on me, and it was like getting really, really tough. And one night, I was at a union meeting, and I ran into the guy, okay? And boy, it was like months of this building up. I was losing sleep over it. $900, that's a lot for a blue-collar guy, you know? And I remember running into this guy, and a crowd of people outside, and I just laid into him, and I, started, and I said a curse word. And you know what he said? There's your Christian! There's your Christian! Look at this guy! I tell you, he could have, you know, and I never got the money. It wasn't about the money. I, if, if you would have gave me the money, it would have been worse. I walked away feeling this small. Because I grieved the Holy Spirit of God, and I felt this, I had, I, I had nothing to say. I turned around, and I walked away. It took me a long time to get over that. Mm -hmm. I really disappointed God, and I felt, oh, how did I fall into this trap? Mm -hmm. How did I do this? Completely out of all the years, and you think about all the years you put into building your character, you build a reputation, one slip up, you're done. Then I'm not going to listen to you. You're a fraud. If you can't say the gospel, live the gospel. I'm going to read in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 19 through 26. I'm going to read this in New Living Translation. It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, your lives will produce these evil results. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, Eagerness for lustful pleasures, idolatry, participation in demonic activities, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, divisions, the feeling that everyone is wrong except those in your own little group. And 
And a lot of people like this. I think I'm in that group. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But, look at verse 22, but when the Holy Spirit controls your life, now keep in mind, not doing those sins, that does not get you to heaven. It's a result of you already on your way there because you're saved. That's why it says in verse 22, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, that means you're already saved. Paul is talking to Christians who are already saved. He will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If there is no conflict with the law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have now nailed the passions and desires of their sinful natures, nature to the cross and crucified them there. If we are living now by the Holy Spirit, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or irritate one another or be jealous of one another. Because you know what happens when you start to live holy? You start to think you're something. That's the, it's like a slippery slope. When you start to live really good, you start to think, yeah, pretty darn good Christian. Then you become prideful. That's another sin. You have to always be careful that you don't think of yourself too highly. Mm -hmm. Does anybody, if we have some time here, and I'll close with one more thought. Does anybody have any questions? What is the great, the, the thing that you always fear of someone asking you? You don't know how to, how to respond. Anybody have one of those things? Karen? My husband used to ask, I would mention things in the Bible, and he'd say, how do you know that those people wrote that? Like, how do you know this is a fictional book that was written years ago, and then people just kept adding to it, making up stories? And That's, that would intimidate me so much. It just drove me nuts. Got a, a great answer for that one. Because, you know, the first thing, well, you have to be careful that you're not sarcastic. First of all, you have to say, well, the Bible says holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Also, the Bible was written upon thousands of years and it was completely organized and everything fits. Things that were prophetically told thousands of, that were going to happen thousands of years in the future. You know, person A back here couldn't know what person B was going to write. Everything fits together perfectly. But if you want a smoking gun one, you can say, well, where do you get your facts from? Mm -hmm. Textbooks? School? Professors? Who wrote those things? Mm -hmm. Men. See, you have faith in men, too. Mm -hmm. But I have faith in men who are inspired by God. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the responses you can have. Everyone that we, you guys follow books written by men. So do you. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. Okay? And where are they taking us? What do they know about, like God said to Job? Where were you, Job, when I formed everything? Okay? Any, any other questions? Uh, what about the people who like live on deserted islands? They've never heard the gospel. Okay. Like, yeah, that's a that's a great. Everyone always yeah. asks that. Yeah. How about someone who lives on some, you know, Timbuktu? They never heard the gospel. Well, God, number one, He says no one's going to go to hell unfairly. Mm -hmm. Now, what God does, He puts in us this desire to look. That's, you know what? One thing that reaches everybody is the heavens and God's handiwork. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God, and his handiwork showed the, you know, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Mm -hmm. Meaning, wherever anyone is, and this is how this works, people, God says, you will be without excuse. Because if you look up, everyone's going to wonder, every tribe will look up and say, I wonder where we came from. Mm -hmm. The minute that person has that question, God will send a missionary to that person. Mm -hmm. Why do you think missionaries, you know, for some reason I got called to go to, you know, uh, Uganda. Why? God says, go to Uganda. There's a bunch of, there might be one person there. Mm -hmm. God says, you let me worry about getting him or her the gospel. Mm -hmm. Okay? No one's going to go there arbitrarily, everyone, before they die. Either God says he knows who's not, and this is not being chosen for salvation, but he knows those who are going to reject it. So if there's somebody somewhere that if you sent the missionary, you gave him the gospel, no matter what, they would not accept it, God says, I'm not going to send him. They would never accept it anyway. So there's your answer for that. Any other uh, questions that you're afraid of or things that scare you? Can you have one more there? 
Okay, well, but also, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I have friends that ask me, why do young kids die? Um, right. Why is there war? Uh, it's, it's things that uh, I can't answer because I just don't understand why that happens. The answer to that one, and you're going to be, uh, we're going to, when we come back, uh, not next week, but the week after, we're going to start a series. If God is so good, why? And I have a list of, I thought of every possible thing. Why, why are there kids in the cancer ward? Why did God allow Hitler to do this? Why, why, is, all, why is there COVID? You know why? Because there's sin. Okay? When the world fell, okay, it, it put a curse. It, it started to decay what God had established to be good. You know what? Before the fall of man, you know, there was no uh, meat-eating animals. There was no poison ivy. There was no mosquitoes or ticks. Okay? Everything was good. Okay? It's interesting how people will blame God for all the evil. God said, the evil is because of you. And if people, well, why doesn't God stop it? Well, then I'd have to stop your evil, too. Mm -hmm. And anything you want, you want all that evil over there stopped? Well, if I made people do that, I would have to make, you're not going out to a bar and getting drunk and sleeping with people. Well, that's what I like to do, though. But you're complaining about the, the children who are dying of cancer. All those diseases were never meant to be. Mm -hmm. They're all a result of the fall. And I came to correct that. That's why Christ came on the cross to correct the destruction that it wasn't supposed to be. It wasn't supposed to be cancer. It wasn't even supposed to be hard labor, people. We could have just had a good time. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? Um, this is a question from personal for me. Do the, do the dead know what's going on on earth? And do you think the dead speak to us personally through dreams? No. Mm -hmm. the de dead, you know, absent from the body, present from the Lord, if you're saved, the dead the have dead. no contact with anything on here on earth. God forbids it. You look at, look at Leviticus and those things. No contacting with dead spirits. And if anyone thinks they are, they're not contacting Uncle Joe. Yeah. They're contacting a demonic yeah. being who's mimicking that voice. There is no kind. God, God forbid you even trying to. Remember what he did to Saul when Saul went to a witch because he wanted to get some information from the other side. Don't do that. Okay? Uh, I just have one more. Uh, I get asked sometimes, what about all the people before Christ? Yeah. That, that's a, that's a, a great one. Same yeah. thing. We as Christ, people here on this side of the cross, we look back to the cross. Right. Everyone in the Old Testament before the cross, they look to the cross. Everything that God was saying with the sacrifice of the animals, you know, uh, sacrificing, you know, uh, your, what is most precious to you, the most precious lamb, was a picture. Because how do people get saved back then, the same way they do now? What, what does it say about, uh, what's the name, Abraham? Abraham was saved by faith. Faith in the coming Messiah, okay, and his work and atonement on the cross. We are saved by the Messiah who already came and paid for our sins on the cross. Right from the beginning, it was always the same way. People say, well, didn't they get saved in a different way? But no, always saved by faith in what God has done, not our own works. Okay, so it's the same for those back there, for those here. Anybody else? Any other questions? Anything else? That's it? There's always some tough questions. You know, one of the greatest things over the years that I have found, and getting back to my philosophy, you know, and, and I'm not saying it's, it's, it's always the best. There are some times when, and, you know, God wants you, you know, I, I know there's a way of the master, and, you know, you can reach people that way, but not everybody can do it. Everybody, you all have our nerves and stuff. But I would just, and this is what I would do. I would pray in the morning, go, God, if you bring someone into my <laughs> existence today who's searching, or you give me an open door, Please do it. And you know how many times God would and I would mm -hmm. keep my mouth shut? God said, you told me to And have a perfect opportunity. Someone said, you know, my, my someone's died. I wonder where, you know, I, I'm afraid. You know, and I would just be like, I'm afraid to say this. God says, you ain't, you, I'll give you somebody every day who's looking for answers. You have to want to say something. So getting back to what I did, you know, I just said, God, you know what, I'm just, you know, obviously I'm a little bit better now, I think, uh, than I was back then when it comes to sharing my faith, uh, you know, because you, you've 
if you do something a lot, you know what to need, you know, what to encounter. Always pray before you do. Always pray. And when you're talking to someone, as they're speaking, be praying. Father, tell me what to say. I don't know what to say to this person. <laughs> um, I'm going to and don't be afraid to say, I don't know the answer to that one. Mm -hmm. You know what? But I'll get back to you. If you're really interested in that, I will do research. I'll get back to you. I'll write. I'll talk to my pastor. Whatever it is. Okay? Don't just make stuff up and just because you don't want to look like an idiot. I'd say, I don't know. That's a good question. But it still doesn't answer the problem that we're, we were talking about before, about our sin problem. We don't have the sin problem. You know, and, and I know in Way of the Master, you know, Ray Comfort came up with that thing. And, and it's, when he says Way of the Master, it's the Way of Christ. Mm -hmm. He uses the law to bring people to Christ. It's a schoolmaster. And what does Ray Comfort do? He goes to, because doesn't ask you a question. Uh, you think you're a good person? Yeah. You think if you stood before God right now, you'd be good enough to get into heaven? And some people go, some people say yes, some people would say no. But let me ask you a question. Okay, you say you're good. Uh, let's let's go with the commandments. Have you ever broken any of the commandments? Have you ever lied? Yeah, I guess a little bit. Have you ever stole? Yeah, a little bit. Have you ever lusted after a woman or a woman? Yeah, a little bit, I guess. Uh, well, just those three right there. You're all guilty. The Bible says if you if you offend in one, you're guilty of all. Mm -hmm. And you just and, and he go through the whole thing. You just call yourself a lion, demon, a, <laughs> you know, slandering, perverted fool. And now, do you think with those things, if you stood before God with your holiness? He will let you in. No, I guess not. Because you, you can't be good. The people will have a misconception of the Ten Commandments are not the rule to get you into heaven. They're the rule to show you why you can't get there. Pastor, can I share something with, with great yeah. comfort really quick? I love when he says, um, like he said, have you ever told a lie? He said, yeah. Have you ever stolen anything? Uh, I don't think so. Well, why should I believe you? You just told me you were a liar. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, no, he's really good. Yeah. He has the gift of... And, and you know what? One thing about him, he never loses his temper. He's calm as can be, loving, gentle, kind spirit. He's a good example of, of Christ and the way to do it. He doesn't beat up on people. He's, you know, and then he goes out of the way. Hey, I'm just, you know, I just ask that you pray about what I talked about. That's all. If you have any questions, you understand know, how you reach me. You don't have to like nail it, but you, you, know, you plant a seed. But again, you know what? The law is, the law really just proves that I'm a sinner. We're all sinners, that's the problem. We're not good enough to get to heaven on our own. If we were, then Christ, then God was a fool to give his son on the cross for nothing. If we can just give up chocolate for Lent, then what was the purpose of Christ? And how people live their lives? Well, I was good for a whole week. I'm good, to, my hands stamped already. No, God says, you're not good enough. My son is. Okay? And his righteousness, you know, is imparted unto us. We only enter into heaven because of Christ's righteousness, not our own. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between religion and a relationship. God is not my father, not a God who's going to, you know, just hit me in the head all the time. He's my father who's going to guide me, comfort me, correct me, and I'm going to be adopted into his family. It's the, you know, doctrine of adoption. Um, anyone else? Anything else? Okay, uh, one by really quick. Uh, if you do have any other questions, let me know. But I do ask you to pray. And those, if anybody online here has any questions or are listening, please send them to us. I promise I will give you any answer I can. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. But uh, pray about not uh, next week. We have the business meeting. The week after, going to go do some crazy thing because I saw someone. I'm going to close with this. Uh, Somehow, you know, on Facebook, someone jumped in to a conversation and Christians were talking about how great you know, God is and if this person went and he just went blasted, well, how about all those kids in the cancer world? How about this? And he just went down the list mocking. He pulled scripture. How about the time when God told God's people to go kill man, women, and children? How about that? How about this great God you serve? And he was down the list. So I wrote down everything he said. And we're going to give an answer. And I added much more. Because people, there is an answer for every single thing. Okay? And when you find the answer, you actually understand the whole world view of how things are and why they are where they are. If we understand what God told us, we will, and I promise, when we go through the scriptures, you will understand that's why there's evil. That's why 
Hitler was alive. That's why, why didn't God stop the airplanes from flying into the Twin Towers? Why didn't he stop that? People, people were asking, where was God on 9-11? Hmm. God was doing what he always does. Okay? And we're going to talk about that stuff. Where was God? I said, God, I have to add that to my list. Where was God on 9-11? Why didn't he stop the terrorists? Okay? And there's one answer that's the most important, pivotal answer to all of these questions uh, that we're going to get to. But anyway, thank you so much for being a part of this uh, series tonight. Um, if you don't agree with what I said, I could be wrong. Uh, let's get scriptures out and let's see what the Bible says. And uh, let God be the decider. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word and its power. Father, it, it's, you, the word of God is called a two-edged sword. It means it cuts both ways. It cuts away the disease, and, but it also cuts away the lies, too. It cuts away the sin, but it cuts away from all the error, Lord. And it exposes what's beneath the truth. It brings us to the truth. And there is absolute truth. And the Bible says Jesus Christ is the truth. He doesn't just have truth. He is it. He is intrinsically the truth. And no one comes to the Father but through the Son. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Father, well, I pray everyone here understands that. And I, I ask for forgiveness for any arrogancy that I had, any malice in my tone. Forgive me, because those are my sins. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.